वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला दिस इज आरोत्रिका दास आई टीच इन इंग्लिश डिपार्टमेंट रामजस कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली एंड वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग प्रोज एंड क्रिटिसिजम इन द रोमांटिक पीरियड विथ रेफरेंस टू विलियम वर्ड्स वर्ड सैम्यूल टेलर कोलरिज एंड पी वी शेली एंड बिफोर वी गो ऑन टू द एस्टिक थियोरी ऑफ रोमांटिसिजम वी नीड टू नो वॉट इज रोमांटिसिजम द टर्म रोमांटिसिजम डिस्क्राइब्स द लिटरेली and philosophical engagement of the late 18th and 19th centuries now late 18th and 19th century is an era that witnessed or is an era of revolution a french revolution and b industrial revolution inspired by the revolutionary ideals of the age the romantics attempted to transform the act of writing they wanted to move beyond the earlier age neoclassical form of writing now three ideas which are at the heart of romanticism are a nature b imagination and c individual so the romantics attempted to go or move beyond reason and intellect instead of reason and intellect they posited what is called subjective emotions and spontaneity as against order and the third is radical skepticism with regard to the precepts of enlightenment today we'll discuss wordsworth and coleridge's preface to lyrical ballads then coleridge's biographia literaria and finally we we'll end with a discussion on shelley's defense of poetry 1840 what we'll try to do is we'll try to trace a trajectory from wordsworth to shelley it is a trajectory of romantic prose writing that critique the certainties of intellect and reason and establish as poets and established poets as shelley famously puts it the unacknowledged legislators of the world we understand romantics as an it's a an literary and aesthetic movement that rejected the emphasis on reason and retreat into the neoclassical form of writing how did the subjective turn in aesthetic theory come about first it's influenced by john locke's writing essay concerning human understanding this was published in 1690 now locke argues that the human mind is like a tabula rasa blank mind it absorbs ideas through sensory perceptions then reflects and generates ideas locke theory of the human mind is predicated on the idea of association of ideas david hartley then develops the lockeanian model in observations of man 1749 and hartley proposes that the external objects create vibrations in the human mind which thereafter form the basis of ideas and for both locke and hartley it is a process of association through which man arrives at knowledge and hartley calls knowledge as morality and divinity for wordsworth poetry is dependent on this habit of association that he borrows from the lockeanian model the natural landscape is vital to the development of the poet's mind it is crucial to understand that wordsworth also differs from the lockeanian model how the source of the poem is not the external nature like locke rather in wordsworth it is individual poetic consciousness unlike locke who believes that the sensory experiences of the external world shape the human mind Wordsworth stresses the importance of the individual consciousness of the poet mind. The best example is sublime. For example, sublime for the romantics is not a quality of the external landscape. It is how it the external landscape affects the poet's mind. 
with awe and fear and the sense of wonder. Now, what happens then is, for the romantics, the emphasis is on the inner feelings of the poet. This is both a resource for the poet and also a model for understanding poetry. In other words, introspection and reflection becomes the hallmark of poetic creation. The subject of reflection, that is a poet, the poetic self, his mind occupies the center stage in romantic aesthetic theory. And now when we go on to discuss specifically Wordsworth, Coleridge, Shelley, what we'll see is that the aesthetic theory is not only about the act of writing poetry, it moves into questions like who is a poet, what is poetry, and finally, what is art. Now, Wordsworth and Coleridge write lyrical ballads in 1778. Wordsworth includes the preface to lyrical ballads in 1800. The preface becomes a critical manifesto for romantic aesthetic theory. So we need to understand what are the key ideas in the preface. Now, Wordsworth rejects poetic diction. Then this is a phrase that he uses, godliness and inane phraseology. And another word is the vague, glossy, unfeeling language of poets. For Wordsworth, poetic diction alienates human sympathy. There is no essential difference between the language of prose and of metrical composition. Poetry should be composed in what he calls the real language of men, the less restrained language of the low and rustic. For Wordsworth, meter is not essential to poetry, but only an additional source of pleasure. Another phrase that he famously uses is, poet is a man speaking to men. There are three ideas that we need to understand. For Wordsworth, a poem should be talking to all men, should be about common ordinary experiences. It should represent the truth, the object of truth is uh, the object of poem is truth and not scientific experiment. And there's a famous line that Wordsworth uses. He defines poetry as spontaneous overflow of powerful emotions recollected in tranquility. Second is, a poet is a man speaking to men. He has greater knowledge of human nature and a greater power of communication. So he can not only communicate his own feelings, but he can also communicate feelings of those that are near him. And third, poetry should be always in the language of what he calls the low and rustic. Poetry is breath and finer spirit of all knowledge. And this is again a quote from Wordsworth. And poetry is emblematic of a deep sympathy between man and nature. It is always about common life and ordinary things. Now, these are the crucial ideas that Coleridge responds to and critiques, in fact, in his book, Biographia Literaria, 1817. This was published in 1817. Now, Biographia Literaria is not only a critique of the two prefaces that appear uh, of Wordsworth, but is also an autobiographical, philosophical, religious critical text. On one hand, Coleridge rejects empiricism, materialism as adequate explanation of human psyche. Interestingly, Coleridge develops an argument about how the human mind works. And this is where his ideas begin to differ from Wordsworthian idea. Now, Coleridge argues that the mind processes details, reflects, associates, connects impressions, ideas, and then moves beyond sense to imagination. And therefore he creates two categories, fancy and imagination. Now fancy is the faculty of the mind that gathers details. Imagination is when the mind creates something new with the coming together of disparate images. 
Fancy is a passive power. Imagination is an active power. It, it forges new territories. Fancy enables the mind to pause, make sense, create and consolidate images. It's a function of memory. And, and uses what he uses the term, Coleridge uses the term, fix, fixities and definities. Imagination transforms what fancy acquires. This is an active power of the mind. It transforms, rearranges and metamorphosizes the fixities and definites that fancy acquires. Now after fancy and imagination, Coleridge further develops imagination into two kinds, primary, secondary. Primary imagination is the power of perception. Is It's an innate ability of man to perceive. This is common for everyone. Secondary imagination is a heightened degree of conscious will that only a poet possesses. Secondary imagination is what Fan Coleridge calls synthetic and magical power. It is an agent of unifying process. The formless mass of experience that fancy had accumulated first is dissolved and dissipated by primary imagination, now if, which is available to all. And by secondary imagination is unified by the poet to create and transform and make something new. Now, in this context of two kinds or ways of understanding poetic self, we need to understand the dialectic unity between Coleridge and Wordsworth. As we discussed, Wordsworth, for Wordsworth, meter is an ornamentation. Now Coleridge argues that there is no essential difference in metrical composition and the language of the low and rustic once the provincialism is removed. Second, for Wordsworth, imagination is a mode of association. This is what he borrows from the Lockeanian habits of association. For Coleridge, powers of imagination perceive, create, transform and unify our perceptions. For Wordsworth, imagination associates and can explain the human power of creativity. For Coleridge, imagination metamorphosizes, it transforms. And this is the idea that P.B. Shelley borrows. Now, Shelley, when he writes the defense of poetry, and this is published in 1840, he aims to provide a justification for poetry, for a poet, for the act of writing poetry against the attacks in the age of scientific materialism. He is insisting on the social and moral utility of poetry and how poetry is useful to man. And Shelley does that not by justifying poetry as a mere pleasure, but by developing a theory of art that is aware that imagination is not autonomous. What happens then is the defense of poetry is not only about the act of writing itself. It is an attempt to reconceive what it means to be a poet. Otherwise poet become an empty sign in the scientific temperament of the age. Shelley develops a romantic ideology of a vision that draws the reader's attention into the hermeneutic problem of writing fiction. The defense of poetry that is published in 1840 begins by refuting or by responding to Thomas Love Peacock's account of poetry. The essay is The Four Ages of Poetry. And for Peacock, poetry is a sentimental anachronism in the modern age of reason and science. 
Now Shelley critiques Peacock's idea by asserting that language is inherently metaphorical. Language is inherently metaphorical, expressive, poetic and hence poetry is not a special use of language. And Shelley arrives at this conclusion by dividing the mental faculty into two parts, reason, imagination. Reason is a logical process that enables one to connect ideas and to determine the relationship between disparate ideas. It is a passive act of the mind. Imagination, and this is where Shelley borrows from Coleridge, acts upon these thoughts. It enables creation. It is a source of artistic desires. Now, according to Shelley, imagination apprehends that reality that is beyond the phenomenal world and is therefore not available to the senses and therefore not available to reason. And this is a beautiful line from Shelley. He says that poetry defeats the curse which binds us to be subjected to the accident of surrounding impressions, unquote. And what he means is that imagination is not mechanically chained to the world of sense impression and it does not deal with sense stimulated thoughts. Rather, for Shelley, imagination responds to those impressions and colors them with its light. Now, if I have to sum up the romantic aesthetic theory, now the romantic aesthetic theory posits a visionary idea of poetry. This comes after the Enlightenment after Neoclassical and for the Romantics it was important to theorize the claims on the value of poetry and espouse a poetic selfhood that was almost contradictory if not altogether different from the neoclassical enlightenment poet. And one of the ways in which romantic aesthetic theory evolves is by positing this inward, introspective, reflective, thinking, poetic selfhood. So if for the neoclassical enlightenment and the earlier 18th century poets, language, form, meter becomes important. For the romantics, the idea of a thinking selfhood, the idea of a conscious self that looks inward, so much so that the poet himself becomes the object and the subject of poetry, that itself becomes a means of critiquing the earlier model of poetic creation. And the other thing that we need to understand is that this self, this turn of self-consciousness is in a context of French Revolution, industrialization, emerging scientific materialism. Each of these are crucial to the legacy of Romanticism. Each of these are ways in which the act of writing poetry, the act of a thinking poetic self was being questioned, critiqued, almost seen redundant. So the first person romantic lyric is important because not only it reinvents the organic form of English literary criticism, but it forever creates a new means of looking into the human mind, the human selfhood, that the human itself and the ways in which he thinks and feels can be the object and subject of poetry. And this has an unprecedented legacy. One of the 
or the ways in which we can look into it is by the critical writings is through the critical writings of Jeffrey Hartman, Paul D. Mann, M.H. Abrahams, Kenneth Brooks, new criticism, new historicism, each of these become ways in which the reinvention of the poetic self that romantics espouse is taken forward to. Now when Wordsworth prefers to lyrical ballads, define the poet as a man speaking to men, this is also a way in which he is alerting to a democratization of letters that was emerging in this period. And therefore, hermeneutics and interpretation become important to explain the act of writing poetry or the phenomenon of poetry. The psychological impulse of the poet to create poetry and the interpretive act of reading poetry are married together in each of the romantics that we just now noticed. And uh, this uh, psychological impulse in fact becomes the meta value of romantic poetry rather than the formal structures of rhetoric which was a prevalent mode of understanding poetry in the earlier ages. Therefore, poetry for Wordsworth and Coleridge and to some extent Shelley too reflects a transcendent vision. What kind of vision? This is a vision that is created by the poet and poet's mind. A poet is an imaginative, conscious, senate being. Theorizing about poetry therefore becomes a theory about who is a poet, about the creative process and the response to this creative process. So far what we have discussed is what is romanticism, what are the key ideas of romanticism, how does the romantic aesthetic theory evolve? We began with William Wordsworth, the ways in which he borrows from John Locke, David Hartley. How Coleridge critiques William Wordsworth's ideas in the preface in Coleridge's Biographia Literaria. And finally, how P.B. Shelley borrows and at the same time departs from the older romantics like Wordsworth and Coleridge in his defense of poetry. We try to understand the philosophical engagement of romanticism not only by referring to their works but more importantly by trying to embed their aesthetic theory in the ways in which the new kind of aestheticization of art was emerging in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. We tried to place this theorizing about the art in a context of revolution, in a context of neoclassical criticism, in a context where there is a radical skepticism with the precepts of enlightenment. What we have tried to do so, so far from Wordsworth, Coleridge and Shelley is to trace a trajectory that was critiquing the reason and intellect of the earlier century, establishing the value the, of a poet, the value of act of writing poetry, and the new kind of human selfhood that we see slowly emerging in romantic aesthetic theory. Thank you for paying attention. For further references, please go to EPG Patshala. Refer to the further references and read carefully the e-text that is provided there.
try to understand what is romanticism try to understand what are the ways in which romanticism critiqued earlier century and provided a legacy of its own refer to wordsworth coleridge shelley and the ways in which there is a slow emergence of an aesthetic theory thank you for paying attention